Grumman's F-14 Tomcat was the U.S. Navy's primary fleet defense interceptor from 1974 to 2006. It was the star of the movie Top Gun, and that's why most of us absolutely love them today. What's up everybody? You're watching Model Aviator. My name's Adam and this week we have the hotly anticipated brand spanking new E-Flight F-14 Tomcat twin 40mm. Now once again we have to give a big thank you and a huge shout out to our buddy Scott Elmore for providing this airplane for review for us. Scott, thank you. We appreciate it and I know they do too. So, first impression. This thing looks awesome. Let's check out some glamour shots. E-Flight's Tomcat is a twin 40mm EDF that incorporates AS3X and safe technology. It weighs 18 ounces without the battery, is 29 and a half inches long, and has a 30 inch wingspan. The F-14 arrived in great shape as you might expect in this super nifty box and the build was crazy easy. There isn't one. It comes exactly like you see it, fully assembled, and you can store this plane just like you see it ready to go in this box, fits perfectly. The box is constructed basically exactly the way that E-Flight constructs their Ultra Micro boxes, although you'd have to pump them slap full of steroids for them to meet the size of this. This is a very large box, has a, a super nifty carrying handle. Be a great thing to store the airplane in and transport it in to make sure it doesn't get any dinks or doings, but it's just such a big box for me personally. It'd be easier for me to just store the airplane carefully than to find a place to put this big box, but that's just me. I know some people will find this very useful. Okay, let's cover the features of the Tiny Tomcat. This is an interesting airplane. It is a hand launch or a roll off the ground, and it does have very convenient removable landing gear that just simply pulls out and presses back in, and that includes that super nifty steerable nose wheel. The control is provided via tailorons, which is an interesting way to control an aircraft. We're used to aileron, elevator, and rudder. This one does not have functioning ailerons or rudder, but the stabilizers or tailorons handle everything, elevator and aileron, which is different. And there is a hatch right here that simply pops off that will expose your receiver, your two linear servos for your tailorons, and the linkages so that you can mechanically adjust those tailorons should you need a lot of trim and need to do that. And that brings us to what is by far and away the coolest feature of any Tomcat, and any Tomcat that's a true Tomcat has to have the swing wing mechanism, and this one does. So you have the fully extended position here, you have the mid-swept position, that is so cool, and you have the fully swept position. And an interesting thing about this airplane, and one of the reasons that this was a bit late coming to market, they discovered very late in testing, almost when they were ready to release the airplane, that they had a bit of an issue, and that was that if you had a hard impact on one of the wings, because the wings were hooked directly to the push rods that were hooked directly to the servo, the swing wing servo, that you could trash that servo and strip it. So what they did is came up with a pretty ingenious way of circumventing that. So the little ball that is on the end of each wing is hooked to the push rod via a almost like a squeeze clamp that squeezes around that ball. It's certainly tight enough to handle any flight pressure but if you have a hard impact on the wing, it just simply pops out of that little clevis. And all you have to do is take this top hatch off that is removable, put the little ball on the wing back in the clevis, and you are good to go, and you didn't strip that servo, and that is cool. It is a true twin. It has twin 40 millimeter EDFs, and it is powered by a 2200 four cell pack, and that's where things, at least for me, got interesting. We own six of these HRB 2200 four cells. This is the size that this airplane is supposed to fly on. But when I put these in it, 
they're so much taller as you can see in this picture than the spectrum packs that I would have to shave a tremendous amount of this hatch away and with it not being my airplane I wasn't going to do that and to be honest even if it were mine I still don't know that I would shave as much away and render this as weak as I would render it to make that battery fit. I also know that when you're buying lithium polymer batteries, a lot of the advertisements for these batteries, when they give you dimensions, they're not accurate. So you can't just look at the dimensions of this pack online, find something cheaper that has those same dimensions, and know for sure that when that battery comes in, it will be that size and actually fit. So we ordered the only thing we know for sure would fit, which is the recommended pack, but those are 50 bucks a piece. So to get six of those, would be as much as the airplane. So we got two and we took a charger with us. And when it comes to the instructions of the Tomcat, they're very, very complete. Your main set of instructions will very clearly describe most of the things relevant to the airplane as far as taking your hatches off, adjusting the linkages for your tailorons, getting the ball of the wing back into the little pinch clevis on the swing wing mechanism should you have an impact. Things like that are, are very, very well explained. It's hard to mess that up. Where the confusion lies is there is a manual addendum and that has to do with the programming of the jet. Now first and foremost, when it comes to an F-14, almost always what you have is an array of mixes and flight modes. And that essentially is for each position of the wing. So flight mode one would be wings fully extended. Two would be the midway point, three would be fully swept. So you need to have a mix to either tone down or increase the throw of the tailorons based on the wing position and of course you need to trim the airplane in each one of those modes. Well most of that other than trimming the airplane in most of those modes is already programmed into the E-Flight Tomcat, all you have to do is essentially assign those modes to switches in your transmitter. That's pretty much the extent of what you're doing. Since it's all done for you, it's easy, but what is tripping people up is when you pick up the addendum, it tells you that there are some things in the manual as far as the programming of the transmitter that you need to leave, and then you need to change some of the things here. Well, it tells you what to change relative to the transmitter that you're using, but it does not tell you on here what not to mess with from this. So what a lot of people are doing, and they're making it a lot harder on themselves, they're opening both these at the same time, and they're trying to figure out what part of this do I do, and what part of this do I do. Well, there's a really simple way to circumvent all that mess. Just do everything this says first. Just do it first. Complete it. Doesn't matter if you're going to change some of it. Just do it. Then, come in here, and relative to whatever transmitter you have, make the changes it says to make here. Then you know that you're golden. The parts that are supposed to remain from this will still be there, and the parts you need to change will be changed. Pretty simple. Okay, so we've got everything set up. Time to go fly, right? Well, it is, and we're going to get into that, and we will show you our setup page before the flying, but so that I don't have so much to try and narrate within the flight footage, we want to go over a good bit about the flight characteristics of the Tomcat because there's just so much to talk about. This is an intriguing, it's a bit different. And I just think it'd be a lot easier for me to go over some of the things to look for so that when you watch the flight footage, instead of me interrupting your concentration to watch, trying to narrate so much in such a short time, you can just know what to look for and look for it. And one of the big elephants in the room surrounding this airplane is that nobody can seem to find a video of anybody with the confidence enough to hand launch this other than the Horizon guys. I'm not saying anything bad about the Horizon guys at all. There is, I believe it can be done. I believe it. But the only footage I can find is of Ali Machinchi. It doesn't hurt that Ali is one of the best pilots on the planet and has an immense amount of confidence in everything he does as it relates to flying. Some of us don't have that much confidence, and a lot of us don't have big hands, and that is where the problem with this airplane lies. Now, I can get my hands around this thing. Do I have a good purchase on it? I mean, kinda. Is it a good enough purchase where I'd be comfortable trying to hand launch Scott's airplane? No. If it were mine, would I try it? Maybe. I don't know. 
I don't have a good purchase on it. I'm not confident. And a lot of people are in that boat. So we came up with a modification that I didn't implement on Scott's airplane because it's Scott's airplane, but I will give him the piece that I made and see what he thinks about it. This is not something you have to do. This is just an idea that might get you started towards a solution to your woes if you have the same concerns that I do. So what you're looking at are it's a piece of eighth inch light ply sandwiched between two flat pieces of eighth inch balsa. And as you can see it is the shape of the intakes on either side of the center of the fuselage where we intend to glue this and I can conveniently and anybody could get all my fingers and my thumb and maybe even an index finger here with which to use this as a, a launching grip and where we envision this thing going is here right in front of the plastic piece that the NACA duct is molded into for the ESC. Now I don't think this piece would affect airflow enough to affect cooling on the ESC but it would give you something to grab a hold of to launch. Now the idea was would be to, and you could refine it and make it look neater than this if you wanted to. I made this in like five minutes just to try to come up with an idea to help you guys. So you could paint this the color of the airplane. You want to sand off the part of the foam that you're going to glue this to so that you get a good purchase. Maybe use a thin coat of 30 minute epoxy to really get this thing in there. And then the idea, we got a battery in the airplane and you can see where we put it it's a little bit forward of the balance point but not enough to where we don't have a good grip on it and the airplane's not wallowing one way or the other you put this there the idea would be to grip it like that and so that you don't put so much stress on the airframe rather than jerking it really fast and putting a lot of stress on it just kind of ramp up nice and easy and accelerate smoothly and give this thing the kind of heave ho you got to give it to give it a good hand launch. This isn't perfect. You may be able to do a better version of this, but hopefully this will get you started towards a solution to the Funky Fresh hand launching issue. So when it comes to in-flight characteristics, our first flight, the maiden flight, was flown with the wings in the fully extended position. And one of the things that we noticed right off the bat is that it wanted to roll to the left and not just a little bit. It was rolling to the left decently hard. It took an inordinate amount of right trim. And we noticed later on when we flew the second flight and progressively swept the wings, the further swept, the more trim it needed. Fully swept, we ran out of trim. Literally ran out of trim and it was still going to the left slightly. I was having to correct constantly to make up for that. I was close, but just enough off for you to notice and for it to be a little bit annoying. Now it is not an asymmetric thrust issue. First of all, asymmetric thrust, if this thing were making more thrust on one side than the other, I think that'd be more of a yawing tendency than a rolling tendency, although I suppose that could be mistaken given the position of of the uh, nacelles. Maybe that would be, that could be mistaken for a roll. But if that were the case, if, if one side were making more thrust than the other enough to where you needed that much trim to correct it. When you backed off the power, the airplane should take a sudden turn or a sudden roll in the direction of your trim. And it's not doing that. So it's not an asymmetric thrust issue. I took a look at this airplane. I'm just going through the motions here, but listen, I looked at everything. I looked at everything in every position of wing sweep. I looked at both wings. I looked at the shape of the nose the shape of the fuselage. I looked down both nacelles from front and back. I checked out the verticals. I checked out the ventral fins. I even looked to see if one wheel was towed more than another. I cannot explain why this airplane wants to roll to the left. No idea. So note right off the bat that once you get the airplane trimmed it flies well you will however if your airplane is bizarre like ours and it takes as much trim as ours did we'd have to make a mechanical adjustment to get this thing all the way in roll trim with the wings fully swept but you can do that if you need to when it comes to how this airplane feels to me it felt a bit 
lethargic. When it comes to the, the rates, well, first of all, the low rate is useless. I don't even know why they, why they mention that. I wouldn't even worry with it. So the high rate, the true rate, the aircraft's rates, in other words, the roll rate and the pitch rate, as well as the power, is less than I thought it would be. I think most people will feel that way. You can have fun with it. You can be tactical about the way that you fly it and, and have a good time and present the airplane really, really well. With the wings fully extended, that is its most powerful, most maneuverable state. As you progressively move the wings into the swept position, by the time you get fully swept, you have lost a lot of the ability to do something with the energy that you have built when you maneuver in that configuration. It's not going to have the roll or the pitch rate that it does when the wings are fully extended and you will bleed whatever energy you have off much faster. So just know with the wings swept, this is not a half throttle to 60% cruiser. This is like an 80 to 85% cruiser to full throttle. You need to be in the power and keep the energy up when you're there and you'll have much more success. So the other thing that makes the airplane feel a bit lethargic to me, I think, is the way the Expo is programmed into this airplane. Anything that has AS3X, as most of you well know, has AS3X built in. And when it comes to Horizon Hobby and their recommendations for this airplane, I think they've been very forthright and very honest about it. They'll quickly tell you this is not a first EDF, maybe not even a second or third. I agree with that for the most part. I definitely agree. It is not a good first EDF, but I think they also know that invariably people that aren't quite ready for this airplane are going to try it anyway. And the high amount of Expo that is built into this airplane, I think, has something to do with how it initially responds. And it's probably there to benefit a less experienced pilot. If you're a more experienced pilot like myself and you're used to a more responsive airplane, it is going to feel lethargic, but there's a fix for that. And that is simply negative Expo. They only recommend 10% Expo because they know that that's just in addition to the Expo that's already there. Well, you can dial that out and you can start progressively dialing in negative Expo. That's what it's there for. That's why your transmitter will do that. Most people never, ever experiment with that. But it's there to take an airplane that is not responsive and make it feel more responsive. So you could dial in negative Expo in three or four negative percents at a time and just build it up until the airplane feels the way that you think it should feel around center stick. My problem was I was having to dig too deep to get the airplane to respond and do subtle things that I wanted it to do. I don't want to have to move the gimbal very much to get that response. So plugging in some negative expo could absolutely fix that for you if you're feeling the same thing we are. All right, so we're going to get to the setup page and then get to the flying. Know that when you see this setup page, we basically set the airplane up by the book and just flew it in the high rates. We had a very short weather window with which to get this footage done, and we want to try to get the airplane to Scott without keeping it for weeks and weeks. So we did not implement our idea about the negative expo. We just didn't have time to mess with it, but just know if it were mine and I had time, I'd be getting after that because I think that would really improve the way this airplane feels, at least to me. So hopefully we have briefed you enough on the flight characteristics and what we're thinking so that what you're seeing will make some sense. We'll do a little bit of narrating to just describe a couple things we didn't talk about. And uh, then we'll meet you back here and sum this thing up. So check this out. This is our maiden takeoff. This is our first stall test. We didn't let it get 
as deep in the stall as we wanted to, so we're going to do it again after this. It's still very easy to recover even if you get it in a deep stall. Just takes a bit more room and this will be our maiden landing. This was our last flight of the day with the Tomcat. This would be my fourth flight at this point. I was getting pretty comfortable with the flight envelope and having fun with it. It takes a decent amount of down elevator for inverted flight, but there's still plenty there to even climb inverted. I'm about to put the wings in the two swept positions, and it's worth noting that the rolls that you see are full deflection in both those positions. You definitely lose some roll rate with the wings in the fully swept position, but we found turning the plane in that position was no problem.
you can get the Tomcat slower than we got it on landing there and we've got some bonus footage coming up that shows that this first bit of bonus footage is just simply a full power vertical climb and here we're going to hold it in ground effect a bit more and that's about as slow as we can get it on touchdown. Okay, so one of the advantages of the bad weather that we've had and not being able to get our video out as fast as some other people did, we've had the opportunity to watch their videos and read a lot in the forums about people's impressions of this airplane. And something that's interesting about this airplane, and it happens this way for some planes, People seem to be really hot or really cold. There's not many people in the many caveats that are the center. They just kind of glaze over that, most of them. That's pretty much where I'm at. This airplane has some negatives, to be fair, but it has a lot of positives. And for me, it's an overall positive vibe with this airplane when I really think about it. So, what's negative? It annoys me that you have to buy a specific size battery to fit this battery bay. Yes, you can trim down your battery hatch to maybe fit something larger, but I just feel like you shouldn't have to do that. So that annoys me, but it's easily fixable. The hand launching is a little bit annoying because it just seems to be clearly hard. I mean, if there's nobody doing it except Ali Machinchi in videos, then people like me are apprehensive, hopefully, our suggestion will fix that for a lot of people and that brings about something that's really good about this airplane. When you get to the positives of the airplane, when you compare this to airplanes that I think are fair to compare it to, which are the 50 millimeter array of single engine EDFs out there, they use a very similar if not the same size battery. You can fly them on 4S and they're about the same size and weight as this. All of those are hand tosser belly lander affairs. The cool thing about this is, first and foremost, it can do something that none of those airplanes can do, and that is be an F-14. And not just any F-14, but a really nice looking version of it. It looks great. It has the one feature every F-14 has to have to be worth modeling, the swing wings. I love that. I also love the fact that if you get the hand launching licked, which hopefully we have, you got removable gear. You can't do takeoffs, landings, and touch and goes with any of those others, but you can do it with this one. And I like that. And as far as the power and the climb rate and the maneuverability is concerned, while some of its contemporaries, some of the competition, if you will, they do have more climb rate, they do have more maneuverability. Does that matter in the case of this airplane? And that's just a matter of perspective. My take on it, I had to ask myself two questions. One, can I present this airplane in a way that makes me happy? And two, when I'm doing that, is it fun? Yes and yes. I mean, to be fair, that last flight, I really had a good time with this airplane. Didn't get to fly it as much as I'd like to, but by the last flight, I was really getting comfortable with the wing positions and knowing what I could and couldn't do. And by the way, yeah, the most maneuverable position is with the wings in the fully extended position. The least maneuverable position is fully swept. Well, that's exactly like a full-scale F-14. When they need to turn their tightest and maneuver their quickest, they have the wings in the fully extended position. So to me, that's just scale. So I kind of like that. I like going between the two, having to know my limitations, and kind of stay on top of it. It's fun. It's a fun challenge to me. Some may not feel that way, but that's my take on it. I like it. I like it for that reason. So, we're going to put a link in the description where if you think this is the airplane for you, you can go straight to Horizon Hobby's page and purchase one. We're not affiliated with them. We're just trying to make it easy for you to get to this bad boy if you'd like one. And I can certainly see why so many people want one. It is cool and with the right approach and the right expectations, you can have a really good time with this airplane and have a really nice F-14 that doesn't take up a lot of room. So with that, 
We're going to sign off. Thanks for watching. I hope what we did today was helpful for you. Take care of yourselves. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't. And we'll see you next week with something else cool with wings. They probably won't swing, but it'll have wings.